Flanagan. And next month marks the centenary of the birth of Flan O'Brien, widely regarded as one of Ireland's most original and subversive comic writers. He was a trinity in his own time. His real name, Brian O'Noolon, or Brian O'Nolan, also publishing as Miles McGopoline as well as Flan O'Brien. He wrote in Irish and English, and that bilingualism marked much of his writing, wordplay and wit. His novels at Swim Two Birds, The Third Policeman, and On Bail Buck, or The Poor Mouth, remain fresh, vigorous and unexpected, while his Krushkin lawn columns for the Irish Times reflected the culture and politics of the day, but also heightened and imagined reality into another country, an enduring land of miles. In this centenary year, and almost 50 years on from his death, tonight we look at the work and legacy of Flann O'Brien. Was his writing as subversive as it sometimes seems, or was it hobbled in some ways by his position as a civil servant? Did his loyalty to the new Irish state restrict his artistic voice? How does his remarkable work reflect the social, political and cultural values of his day, and how do we see and read it now in this 21st century? Was he postmodern before the term existed? With me in studio, Carl Taff, author of Through the Looking Glass, Flann O'Brien, Miles McGopoline and Irish Cultural Debate. From New York, Jenica Baines, editor of a new collection of essays, Is It About a Bicycle? Flann O'Brien in the 21st Century. And joining us from Oxford, Sligo-born Keith Hopper, who teaches literature and film studies at Oxford University and is author of the book Flann O'Brien, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Postmodernist. Uh, Keith Hopper, in a, in a recent article for the New Statesman, you wrote about Miles or Flann O'Brien as this postmodern writer when it was neither popular nor profitable in his own words. Uh, yeah. How do we see that postmodernism in his work? Well, I suppose there's two ways of thinking about this. You know, there's two points to introduce people. As Miles, he's the greatest satirist probably since Jonathan Swift. But as Flann O'Brien, he is, as you mentioned, the Trinity. He's the, the vital third element in the Trinity of the great Irish novelist. You've got Joyce, the father of modernism, Beckett, the son. He's the Holy Ghost in the machine. Unlike Joyce or Beckett, he, he never lived abroad. He stayed at home. And so the strategies of what he called silence, exile and punning are of a different order. I think he wrote at a time when there was extreme censorship in Ireland. And behind the linguistic fireworks that he's famous for, I think he says more about the realities of Irish life in the 40s and 50s than Joyce or Beckett ever could. So he's, he's quintessentially post-modernist. He comes after the modernist project and responds to it in a very new and original way. It's, it's very striking. You mentioned censorship there. It's very striking that his work was never censored. How well, come? Well, it wasn't censored yet. The laws are still on the uh, statute books. It wasn't for one to try in. I mean, the later novel, um, The Hard Life, from 1961, has a, a character in it called Father Fart, which F-A-H-R-T, which was part of his attempt to provoke the censorship board into slapping a ban on it. I mean, it wasn't banned, it was just ignored, much to his disappointment. But I, I think the, the spectre of censorship hangs above his work. I, I think in the 40s, 50s and 60s, all of the major modernist writers were banned in Ireland, including Joyce and Beckett. But I think if you read his novels carefully, like At Swim or The Third Policeman, he smuggles in a great deal of taboo topics especially relating to sex and sexuality. I think it's part of what makes him such a complex and subversive writer. And, and we'll return to that complexity and, I suppose, again, the subversive element in it. Um, Carl Taff, if, if we take that image of Ireland through the looking glass from the title of your book and hold up the mirror of Flann O'Brien, uh, Miles McGopoline's work, to the Ireland of his day and, indeed, I suppose, to, the, to Ireland now, what do we see? What's, what's reflected back? Well, I use the image of, of Lewis Carroll's looking glass because I think a lot of what Miles done, does in the column is to make the ordinary very, very strange. And what I see in it is a kind of surreal and nonsensical version of Ireland. You know, we think of, of the Ireland of the 30s and 40s as a very dull and provincial kind of place, you know, very claustrophobic. Um, but when it's refracted through his kind of wild imagination, it comes out very, very differently. And I don't, I don't know, you know, how you would see the Ireland of today through Miles' work, perhaps... We realise now that the place he was living through was much stranger than we ever thought it was, with and all I, the revelations of the last few years. You know? Absolutely, I mean, and, and I'm very struck by that. You know, you talk again in in your book about um, how that you know the comic fiction and journalism uh, he wrote at his peak in the in the 30s and 40s didn't so much uh, reflect the nation back at itself, um, but instead gave us this much stranger country, um, a comic version of an independent Ireland estranged to itself. And, and that's, I suppose, in a way, that's what we're looking back to now, is that, that notion of an estranged country. Mm. Yeah, it seems, 
reading things like on Bell Book, The Poor Mouth, you get the sense of Ireland as a very self-conscious place, which in a way perhaps we still are, you know, we're so used to asking questions about what is Irishness, so used to think of ourselves in a very self-conscious way, making ourselves exotic to ourselves. And I think he plays around a lot with that in Crushkeen Lawn and in something like The Poor Mouth with kind of cliches and stereotypes of Irishness, with that introspection and that fascination we have with ourselves and making pictures of ourselves. Um, again, you know, a phrase from A Swim, Two Birds, one that you pick up on, um, the self-evident sham, um, and uh, which you say for him encompassed uh, much of the culture of the new state. And again, of much of his work, you were saying that um, you believe it's based on that concept or principle or perhaps reality of, of self-evident sham. Yeah, he's a, he's a beautifully self-conscious writer, and I say that in a very positive way. Um, just as you may have said that he handled language with tongs, which is a great way of putting it. I think he puts a great distance between himself and, and how he's writing. And even as Miles, I think he plays the part of the columnist to a great extent. He, he doesn't take any journalistic conventions for granted. Um, even the catechism of cliche, you know, rips apart journalistic prose. And sometimes he starts berating his readers for wanting to be cajoled and instructed and told what to think about. You know, Miles doesn't do that. So always, and I think when he stops being so self-conscious and self-reflexive is when the work starts to fail a bit, like with the later novels he tries to be, I think, a conventional kind of novelist and it doesn't work anymore for him. Do you have a favourite work of his? For me, it would have to be Krushkin Law, and I think it's, the, it's a long and strange and complex kind of achievement. I don't think there's much else like it out there. Yes, yeah, but 26 years, I mean, an extraordinary, an extraordinary achievement. Uh, apart from anything else, just the, the duration of the notion of somebody publishing almost every day. Uh, for 26 years. Um, Jenny Cabane's the, the book of essays you've edited is it about a bicycle, Flann O'Brien of the 21st century. Um, many fine and fascinating essays and I'm struck by the fact that you describe him in your introduction as, quote, a tidal writer. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Well, one of the defining features of Flann O'Brien and Miles Nagoplin both is that he works in, in multitudes. He comes up with lots and lots and lots of different versions of himself, lots and lots of different names for um, his characters and names for himself. So um, in that way, the, you know, he, he likes to sort of express as much as he possibly can. And then on the other hand, he, he won't give us very much um, in other regards. So, for instance, we, we know... Um, very little about, um, for instance, the women in his books. He gives us very few women, um, and we we can sort of pull from that very little about what what he wanted to make women um, be in his in his literature. But on the other hand, we have these fantastic characters like in *It Swim Two Birds*, where we have Slug Willard and um, Lamont, and and just these fantastic characters that he conjures out of out of out of sort of the, the public consciousness, really, this idea of a shared literature. So, um, Carl mentioned there uh, the Krushkin Lawn, you know, as possibly her favourite, you know, of, and, and, and a remarkable achievement, um, possibly her, her favourite aspect of his work. Again, you said that, you know, arguably it could be seen as his magnum opus. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's just so much work that can be done still with the Krushkin Lawn. I mean, Carol has really broken new ground with her book, which is really taking the first serious and, and considered look uh, at Krushkin Lawn and what's there, just to see even what we what we have. Because, there, as you say, there's just, you know, years and years of columns where in many of these he, he would have been writing almost daily. So just the sheer volume of what's available to us is so astounding that it's difficult to find a point of entry. And I think that's something that we're, we're kind of still working on right now. Carl, is there still a huge amount that we're not familiar with from, from the Krushkin Lawn columns? Yeah, it's kind of an endless kind of swamp once you start <laughs> wading into it, you know. Um, a lot of the, the stuff that's published in collections at the moment is from the kind of early 40s, um, it is really kind of the peak of what he was writing, but there is a huge amount of other material that's kind of been lost away in the archives. And now, of course, that the Irish Times Digital Archive is available, it's much more accessible to people who can start roaming through it and, and even the Times has started republishing a lot of it. But it's incredible to think that this is one of our greatest writers of the 20th century and there's still a huge amount of material there that hasn't been read since perhaps it was first published maybe 50 years ago. Um, of course, many writers have acknowledged a debt uh, to Miles, to Flann O'Brien. Many have been inspired by him. And one of these is novelist and short story writer Kevin Barry. I think it's fair to say that Flann O'Brien is the kind of writer that you'd have a phase with. Um, I certainly did so in my early 20s. I was living in Cork and I had a kind of a six-month period, I suppose, where I would have um, refused to read anything except Flann O'Brien. And of course, it's desperately dangerous for a younger writer to read Flann O'Brien because you start coming out with all pale imitations of flanisms and you have to work them out of your system 
But when I go back to him now, when I read him now, and I, I do so more than occasionally, what's what's interesting to me is I'm increasingly drawn as much to the newspaper columns, to the Christine Lawn, as I would be to the fiction. And he, he, he disparaged the, the newspaper columns himself. He felt they were keeping him from his life's great work. But I'm not sure if any of his fiction is entirely successful. I don't know if he ever wrote a perfectly successful novel. I think he led himself into all sorts of weird contortions and convolutions with the fiction and kind of went into dead ends. And what's really interesting is when you go back and read the newspaper stuff now, so much of it reads so freshly. Um, he, he doesn't seem at all like uh, out of time. He doesn't seem dated. He's not a museum piece compared to some of the other creatures who were writing at that time and who would have been far more esteemed than he would have been at that time without naming names, Sean O'Fadon. And I think in the 20th century and the late 20th century, an awful lot of Irish literature kind of decided that it had to go in one of two directions. It had to go either towards Joyce or towards Beckett. And Flan for a long time was kind of ignored. But I think all along there was a, a glorious third way available to us, which was to go for deranged comic innovation, which is the only sane response to Ireland as a concept. And our, we live on a very skewed and strange little island. And you, you have to have a warped vision to see it clearly, if that makes any, any kind of sense. The novelist Kevin Barry there. Keith Hopper, I suspect you might not agree with Kevin Barry on uh, the success or otherwise of Flann O'Brien's novels. I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I think he tries out different things. You know, every writer goes up dead ends. And I, I mean, I think the fact that Kevin and other writers like Pat McCabe and Julian Goff and many other Irish writers are taking the lead from him now shows that he opens up possibilities rather than goes up dead ends, I think. Um, I think there's very little to compare in any tradition to At Swim Two Birds or The Third Policeman. That's when he's at his best, you know. When you teach these novels mm. uh, of Flann O'Brien to students who haven't encountered his work before, what's the, the general response? I think you get different responses depending on who you talk to, you know. Um, I mean, he's got this reputation of being a funny man, of being a comic writer, which is part of the reason I think he's been overlooked in some ways. Um, but there's a great kind of darkness that runs beneath that comedy and I think different people respond to it you know you speak to students in America or you speak to students in Oxford here and sometimes they don't get it outside of the the funniness but you know he's a cult figure across central and eastern Europe you know um you, you speak to students in Prague or I've, I've spoken about this in Tokyo and they don't find it strange at all they, they see that that fantasy is the only way of actually describing life as it's lived the kind of ordinary madness of things and again, I suppose that you know this whole thing of language and linguistics in O'Brien, um, yeah. that that strand of of Irishness, of of Gaelic, that that is underpins almost everything and allows him to to play so much with language. I presume again that that actually uh, hits a chord, we'll say, in Eastern Europe. I think so. You know, uh, there's an Austrian film adaptation of Between Two Birds. Some of the best scholarship at the moment is coming out of France, Germany, Holland. And I think language is really the key to understanding his genius. Um, the fact that, you know, as a child he was homeschooled, he grew up speaking Irish. Uh, you know, didn't really engage with English until he was in his teens. Uh, so I think in a strange way, like a, a lot of other great 20th century experimental writers, I mean, I'm thinking of people like Joseph Conrad and Nabokov and... Beckett later on, he wrote most of his work in his adopted language, not in his native tongue. So there's, a, there's always a strangeness built into it. On that theme uh, of the Irish language strand in O'Brien's work and the, the bilingual theme, um, and again, uh, there are two essays, Jenica, in, in your book on that subject. I've been talking to Louis de Puer, head of the Irish Studies Department at NUI Galway, about O'Brien and Irish. How did the first official language mark and inform his writing? I suppose I'm interested in the extent to which Brian O'Neill's own complicated and in some cases fraught relationship with the Irish language is central to his understanding of the futility perhaps of all language as being adequate for purposes of communication and understanding and indeed even for the apprehension of reality. There is a deep, deep suspicion about the capacity of language to generate meaning and meaningful interactions between the human mind and reality. And I think the Irish language is central to all of that. Uh, he's born into a very 
strongly nationalist family. His father is involved in the Irish language revival, as indeed is his is his uncle, uh, Antahar Geroid, a very interesting character, uh, professor of Irish at Maynooth University and one of 